But yeah, tonight we're talking about CSS Grid, and by way of introduction, um, I'm James Steinbach. I'm a senior UX developer, HTML, CSS specialist kind of role at Dockyard, and uh, I have helped a lot of developers who aren't CSS experts and specialists get into Grid. Um, and this is kind of boiling down things I've learned along that path. Um, it's also, anybody who was here a year ago for the Grid talk we did, actually this very month, a year ago, yeah, uh, I'll apologize more for that later. But, uh, this is also taking lessons learned, giving that talk, and watching blank stairs, uh, and kind of making things better. As we get into the talk, I want to first of all introduce CSS Grid by showing the history of how we did layouts on the web, and how we tried to make grids before we actually have a genuine grid layout algorithm. In the beginning were tables. Um, I started doing web development in like 2007-ish, if I remember correctly, and ESPN.com was still a giant table full of nested tables, and the tables all had background images and spans inside of table cells, and that was how the whole layout happened. So if you had like a big swooshy thing like carving up across your whole header, that was chopped up into a bunch of like 100 pixel wide things to match all those table cells, and it was rough. Um, I dodged that bullet because CSS had just gotten good enough to start using, and I spent my first couple of years on a learning on the side, not professionally doing kind of context. So uh, I got one CSS first, not tables. But tables did work for layout back in like 2003, 2006, that kind of stuff. Uh, there are some, drop, some downsides to that, however. Namely, it's markup that doesn't mean layout. A table means I've got tabular data. And when you use table elements, that tells Google and other search engines, hey, this is tabular data, and we should try to process it that way for search engine information. And it tells screen readers like VoiceOver and JAWS, hey, this is tabular data, let's read it to the user like it's actually a table. <laughs> it tells semantic information to both screen readers and uh, search engines. And so table is a bad idea for your page layout. Let's not do that anymore. It's also got some major implementation problems, like it's not responsive. You can change all the CSS layout methods based on the media query. You can't rewrite your markup, which a table is highly markup dependent. You can't rewrite your markup based on media query. So tables are no longer a good idea, but they work a decade and a half ago. Inline block is another good method uh, that grew out of we real us realizing we need CSS methods not just uh, markup methods to control layout. So if you make an element inline block and you give it a limited width, like 25%, uh, other elements can fit to the right of it and create what's, what looks like columns. And it's pretty nice, but the downsides are it's a lot of verbose markup, or sorry, CSS on the children. Every child element needs an explicit width. And if you want to create room for um, gutters, gaps, that's even more complicated math because you have three 20 pixel gutters on a four column grid. You've got to get three quarters of 20 pixels taken out of each of the four columns and then get margin right the right amount. And this is where libraries like Suzy and Neat and Singularity all in the SAS uh, ecosystem and similar ones in Stylus and Less showed up and they handle all the complicated math. So you could write a SAS mix and it was like span three of 12 and it automatically did the right thing and knew if it was the first one in a row and could handle the margins to bump other things away the right gap, and that was better. But it says something that when your layout method requires you to have, it almost requires you to have a preprocessor plugin to actually be able to humanly comprehend math. Uh, and these plugins like Suzy, whatever, would spit out like 10 or 12 decimal points worth of precision on percentage width and margin. Uh, so very complicated and very hard to handle. And then here's another problem. If you hit enter between all of those elements that created grid columns, let's say you have four divs in a row, and you have a line break between each div, the browser goes, oh, a bunch of inline block items? That's kind of like words in my book. And it would put a space character between all of your columns. And so you'd end up with a little like four pixel gap, and the fourth column would fall down. Instead of 25, 25, 25 being even four columns, you get those spaces, and it would break. So now you have to do, and this is the main of CSS, this is, I think, a huge part of why so many developers complain that CSS is frustrating and hard to understand, we had to introduce unrelated CSS properties, like font size zero on the, patient, on the parent and then reset font size on the child. Or we had to hack our HTML. And you could minify it for production and that would fix the problem with spaces. Minifying it would remove that white space. 
but it doesn't help you locally. Uh, so people would actually put the beginning of the next starting tag right after the final ending tag and break lines very oddly and your markup looked really dumb in your editor. So it required habits to even work in the first place. Floating was a little better. It didn't have that weird space showing up everywhere. So you don't have to worry about font size hacks. Uh, but you get the same problem. Every single column needs its own width. The same complicated math applies, especially when you get involved with uh, gaps. And then if you know CSS float, when it float pulls an element out of the normal document flow and allows text to flow around it, float also means that element's parent doesn't get any height from the child. Normally, a parent element in a browser is as tall as the total of all its children. If you float all the children, the parent completely collapses. So picture a grid, a grid, a float grid wrapper with a pixel border around everything. You wouldn't see the pixel border, you would see a line because it would be zero pixels tall because all those floated children don't allow the parent to maintain any height. So we got hacky again and we figured out how to do clear fixes with before and after pseudo elements. And now we've broken something. We can no longer use those pseudo elements to style the parent. That's what they're there for. They're there for decoration because we can't do that anymore. And then there's arguments about whether your clear fix should be a display table or a display block. And, and if you've read clear fix code from you know five, six years ago, you remember these kind of arguments. It wasn't great. You're adding like seven or eight lines of code or a clear fix class to a bunch of elements and it clutters things up. So for a while, developers tried making tables with CSS. It doesn't matter what your markup is. It could be divs or ordered lists or what have you. Display table, display table row, and display table cell on its children will make the browser pull out that old HTML table uh, layout engine and render whatever elements you happen to have using that layout engine. Some downsides to that. Your markup gets way more complicated. You absolutely have to have a row around every set of columns, which means your grid can no longer be responsive. Because if you put a row wrapper around four elements, you can't drop to a three column grid on a medium breakpoint and a two column grid on a small one. Well, sure, you can do two plus two is not four, but your medium breakpoint is unworkable uh, you know, because you can't have different wrapper elements because of CSS. The wrapper element is always in your markup. And if you've worked with table layout, whether an actual table or CSS table layout, trying to put widths onto individual cells is a royal pain and uh, definitely not something that can easily, quickly create a stable cross-browser layout. It's tricky. And of course, there is always a danger that uh, most folks don't realize, but uh, actually happens. CSS influences screen readers. If you make, for example, a list item, anything other than display list item, it's browser user agent default value. Uh, VoiceOver, for example, will stop reading it as a list item and announce it as just a spam of text. Uh, so believe it or not, CSS shouldn't affect voiceover, uh, but it does. It affects screen readers, and so if you go putting table CSS on the elements, there are probably some screen readers that will pick that up and try to semantically treat it as a table. So also a thing to watch out for. Oof, we're almost done. CSS columns, anybody ever use the column properties in CSS? It's kind of cool. Uh, once again, the biggest pro is it's not an HTML table. Uh, you can get precise widths. And here's the awesomest thing that like columns did that nobody else has done. Columns supported both gap and dividers. You can put a rule right in the middle of the gap using like a border type syntax in CSS columns, and it works. Uh, grid doesn't even have a divider or a, uh, a rule. It does have gaps, which are great. Um, but the problem with columns is columns was not designed to be an algorithm to create a bunch of divs that each act as a discrete column. Columns in CSS is a layout engine whose algorithm is designed to make all the columns the same height and spread everything really evenly. Which means if you've got a really tall div and a really short one, it'll split the content and create a break inside of the element you think should just act like a column on its own. So now you've got to put more CSS on each of those divs that are going to act like a column. And that's complicated. I think I implemented this in a, in a live project twice once in like 2012 or 13, and once a couple years later. And columns have been in CSS spec for a long time and relatively well supported on the basic properties for a, quite a while. But it's bugged. Cross browser problems are super common. Um, so, yeah, if you have to do your whole page layout with CSS columns, I feel sorry for you. Um, you can get things done, but it's way more work than it's worth. 
And then we get to the modern era, and somewhere around 2014 or so, Flexbox hit major browsers. And uh, Flexbox was awesome because in addition to being able to set precise proportions on the children, you could also use flexible column sizing. You could tell one column, like, hey, if there's extra space, I want you to move, get bigger twice as much as the other column if there's extra space, and all sorts of really neat flexible things you could do. One problem we're still having, though, is all of the grid measurements, grid, all of the layout measurements are attached to each child, which complicates things. Uh, as you can imagine, if one child gets the wrong number, you, you typo something and you hit 86% instead of being fine, it's going to break and things are going to wrap to the next line probably. Or in Flexbox, if wrapping is disabled, by default it is, um, it'll push itself out of the parent control of the device. Uh, there's no gap support in Flexbox, and the one last downside of Flex is it's only one dimension. You've got a Flex Direction column and Flex Direction row, but you can't create a proportions on both axes. And all of that leads us 15 years of CSS layout to a wish list. I wish we had a layout method that was in CSS so we could change everything we needed to in a media query. No markup changes or edits necessary. We need a layout method that's intentional. No side effects. I don't want to be touching other properties that aren't related to layout for the sake of my layout. If I have to change font size or add a clear fix to make something work for a layout, that's not what we want to do. We need something better. We need a layout method with precision, be able to mix fluid and fixed proportions and get everything to work the way we expect it to. And the last deal is we want two-dimensional layouts, right? When designers go to lay things out, they're laying things out in two directions. They've got rows, they've got columns, and those proportions are, are matched all the way down the page in a good consistent design. So where does that leave us? CSS Grid. Uh, grid did the unexpected. Uh, first off, trivia question. Uh, how, who knows the first browser to implement CSS Grid? Yeah, shout out guesses. I heard uh, Firefox. Firefox? Uh, I'm going to say Firefox. Trick question. Yes, IE 11, but the, the spec wasn't ready yet. So it's not spec grid. It's like grid point mode. Um, and we'll talk a little, more, a little more about that later. But here was the amazing part. With the major browsers, Firefox, Chrome, Edge, and Safari, Drop support for CSS, or added support for CSS Grid, Drop isn't releasing like an album. Uh, they all did it in like four months' time in 2017. From March to I think maybe October, so seven months. All the major browsers added CSS Grid support without vendor prefixes. It's just there and it matches the spec, and it is probably, for as complicated as, as it is, one of the most consistent blocks of CSS uh, spec and implementation as well. Uh, that was kind of an amazing thing. Uh, if you ever get a chance to hear a talk from Rachel Andrew or Jen Simmons or a handful of other folks, even Miriam Suzanne is here in Denver. She'll talk here sometime to the meetup. Uh, they did so much work with the spec authoring team and browser vendors, and it was a very coordinated effort. It was amazing. So here's what CSS Grid gives us. A responsive CSS-only layout method. It only needs grid-related styles. You don't have to chip in on your font sizes or just any weird things to make it work. It allows precise column, row, and the gap measurements. And finally, it allows us to position children anywhere. Any column, row, span, uh, block you want to put things into, it lets you do that. So here's the part where I apologize for what I did here. Um, this is, these are tiny font uh, things just to show you the wall of text. Uh, a year ago I did a talk on Grid and we covered every single one of these properties and values. Like two minutes per. There's 30 by my count and I think there are a couple that I missed on the slide even. Um, and it was like, yeah, trying to rinse your toothpaste out with the uh, fire hydrant. Um, I got glassy stairs, it went a little too long, a lot too long. And uh, it was rough. And I appreciate everybody who was there and who came back since then. Awesome. Um, but we're not going to learn all this tonight, right? That's like driving to the end of the, to the horizon on this road. Not great. Some people like it, sure, sure. And that's kind of like some people are CSS specialists and they geek out on reading CSS Grid and all the pages in MDN and they want to know all 30-something properties before they even get started. 
that's cool. For many folks, this is the way they want to go, and that's great. That's not what we're doing tonight. Tonight we're going to learn this many things. And there's a couple bonus properties I'm going to slip in just because of shorthand and quick. Um, and that's kind of like driving down this road to get to the horizon. And this is kind of targeting, um, as I started working on the talk, I did it for a generalist conference where not everybody was even a front end developer. Uh, I'm doing it again in a month at a uh, Ember conference where most people are JavaScript focused and very few are CSS experts. So I worked at kind of identifying the short, sweet, learn as little as you have to to get the most you can. Y'all know the uh, Pareto principle, 80 20 rule, some folks call it. The first 20% of your effort gets you through 80% of the project, and the next 80% of effort wraps up that final 20% of uh, productive outcome. That's what we're going to do. We're looking at about 20% of the total grid properties, and it's going to give you at least 80% of the power. So this brings us to grid at the bare minimum. In pairing things down tonight, I divided, well, I didn't divide, but I chose one half of a division in grid theory, um, grid, the way the algorithm works. There are two ways you can build grids. Explicit grid, where you define every part of the grid, every column, every row, and implicit grid, where you have a lot of properties involving the word auto, and everything kind of flows and leads to. The auto has a lot more variability, so we're not doing implicit layouts. We're doing what's called an explicit grid layout, one where we define every column and every row. And that's how we've trimmed down to just focus on 20% of the spec. That'll give us a lot of bang for our buck. So, quick pause for audience participation. Uh, anybody have a question before we jump in further? And the history stuff is just kind of a lot of FYI and cool, good to know that. I'm not going to write that code anymore. All right, uh, just so I know where the room is, uh, who's used grid at least in like a code pen experiment or some prototyping on your own just for fun? All right, who's shipped the grid in a production site or a component or app? All right, fewer people. So hopefully tonight we'll give you a lot more confidence in shipping and in getting this into production. Um, I don't have any experience with CSS. Do you think I can still follow along with CSS? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, that's my goal. Right. Um, CSS's syntax is very simple, yeah. uh, which fools a lot of people who come into it like in sideways into thinking it's a very simple programming language. And we're coming out of an era where a lot of unrelated properties had to be there to make things work just right, and it felt a little bit like magic. Um, but grid is a much more explicit and focused layout method. So you won't have to learn anything about font size or background color or word wrap, uh, wrap or white space or anything unrelated to make grid work. So first I'm going to show you two blocks of code. Uh, this is CSS, and the first thing we have is a selector. And that's going to tell the browser to find any element of the class site. Then we have all the properties we want to assign. Display grid is a given. You probably knew that before you got here. Uh, then we're defining template columns. And we'll get into what the syntax means in a minute. We're naming some grid areas to put content into. And we'll get into how this syntax works just below as well. And we're also setting up a gap between the rows and between the columns. And again, we've got another slide digging into that more deeply in a moment. That goes on our container. These are all the children. Uh, the double underscore for folks. What have I done? There we go. The double underscore is from a CSS naming philosophy called Ben, block element modifier, element modifier, uh, which isn't super important other than double underscore means a child element of the parent. So sites header and main and side and footer are all just assigned to new grid areas. And that's all we have to do. And we've got a cool layout. So let's dig into the actual code. The first block of code uh, properties we're going to look into are the container properties. What do you put on the grid parent? And here's like a paradigm shift. All the other layout methods we looked at, whether it was flexbox or inline block or floating or any of those things, require you to put all of your measurements, all of your proportions on every single child element. Kind of verbose, uh, kind of a pain. Especially if you're repeating grid patterns through subsequent rows, and you have to repeat your CSS to get that to work, or your class unique pattern, uh, rather than being able to set up a grid that's more reusable. So we're going to be able to put everything, all our measurements are going to go on the parents. 
and the grid is in, in this way, an abstraction. The grid is an actual element, the grid is a concept, an abstract thing, a bunch of lines that divide columns and rows up on the parent element, and then content can be pushed into those column and row areas. Uh, you don't have to fill every cell on a grid that you don't. Every column and every row doesn't have to have a child element in every place. So a grid cell is not the same as an element. In tables it was. One table cell is one element. In grid you can create elements that span a bunch of cells or a bunch of rows or however you want it to work. And we'll get into that in just a second. So here's what we do with the parent. The first thing, as I mentioned, is make it display grid. And then it tells the browser, hey, on this parent and all its immediate children, we're using the grid layout engine to set everything up. If you don't do anything else, you'll get what's called an implicit grid, and the browser will, I think, just cram everything into one row, and it'll look a little weird. So we're going to give it um, some columns. Columns set up the proportion for tracks along the inline axis of the grid container. That's a bunch of like spec speak, complicated stuff, right? So proportions is how wide should things be. Uh, tracks are the individual column areas. And in CSS Grid, every track has two lines around it. Um, and when you use grid area to position things, those line numbers come in handy. We're not going to focus on that tonight. We're going to use an easier way to locate things on the map. Uh, but when you're counting like column start and row start, you've always got one more line than you have columns. Think of it this way. How many lines do you draw with your pen to create a four column grid? You need five lines, five lines to get all your boundaries. Uh, I did good there. Um, yeah. So you're always going to have one more line. So grid column start one and grid column end five on an element, if you were to do that, would span four columns. Because it goes from the first line, the first boundary to the final boundary, not row or column row. But anyway, uh, these are set up on the inline axis, and this is a special word from the CSS spec. Um, we think of inline axis as horizontal most of the time. Uh, and that's because most of us, especially if English is our primary or first language, are used to a horizontal writing mode. In fact, most of the languages we would have studied along the way in school, uh, anything from Spanish to French to German, uh, anything Cyrillic, or the whole Russian Eastern European block, and Greek, even right to left languages like Hebrew and Arabic, all of that's a horizontal writing mode. CSS is upgrading the way we locate and size and margin and border and pad things to free us from using words top, right, bottom, and left. And we're getting new words like uh, block start, block end, inline start, and inline end. Uh, and these follow the writing mode for the text. I just listed a bunch of languages that left to right or right to left, they're all horizontal, but there are a handful of languages that use a vertical writing mode. Uh, characters in a script like Japanese or some Chinese dialects actually have column-focused text. You read top to bottom in a series of columns, and so the writing mode is vertical. CSS has a property for that. You can make the writing mode on any element, even full of English words, vertical. It's a cool way to uh, tip text like down the side of a block or the side of the screen. Um, and if you do that, you can do that without like rotation, without uh, hacky ways to, I'm in a different talk for a second, sorry. Hacky ways to manage height and width because you're rotating stuff. The language mode, the writing mode actually shifts and the element still picks up its normal natural space. And if you're using inline and block, related words for padding and margin, those will rotate to follow the writing mode. So it's really cool. So what does inline mean? In a line of text inside of an element from the start to the end of the line of text. So in a horizontal writing mode, the start to end of a line of text is always going to be horizontal, left to right. So that's the way columns work in right to left writing mode, a horizontal writing mode, right to left, like we're, like we're accustomed to seeing columns. If you used CSS grid layout, in a website that's translated to Japanese or another language that had a vertical writing mode, the layout would shift to match. Pretty cool stuff. Uh, you're getting bonus responsiveness. It's not responding to screen size, viewport, and normal media query stuff. Your CSS can actually respond to your um, language mode. Not only does grid do that, if you switch your language to right to left, uh, you have a site that has localization and it gets translated into Arabic uh, or Hebrew for those markets. CSS Grid will automatically resort and start and end will shift to match the, the writing mode. Still horizontal, but it'll switch to match right to left, which is very awesome because if you're using grid layout and you start localizing things, you get a lot of your changes for free. Uh, very neat. So anyway, all that to say, that was a big explanation for, what have I done? Sorry, I'm not good at a laser. That's a long explanation for inline axis.
um, its value is any series of valid lengths. And those might look like this. One FR, 50 ms, 35 ms, one FR. And I'll explain FR in a minute. That's a new unit that was added to CSS spec with the grid, and it's really cool what it does. Or 30%, 150 pixels, 30%. You can mix and match your units. Um, grid also doesn't care how many things you stack up inside of it. It will allow all its children to just continue overflowing. Let's say you got a grid and it's you know 100 wide, but you're on like an iPad and 100 is like 724 pixels when you're holding it upright, and you stack like 3,000 pixels worth of content in there, it'll just overflow off the edge of the screen. Uh, grid lets things go nuts like that, and so you, it's really cool. You can create like overscroll shelves. People can swipe back and forth on that way. Grid is a neat layout method to get that, and with a simple CSS overflow property added. So yeah, all of these are good uh, values for grid template columns. This one would have a column that's one FR, I'll explain what that means. Second column that's 50 M's, M is a unit based on the current font size. Another column that's 35 M's, and a final column that's one FR. The first column in this grid would be 30% of the grid itself. The second column would be 150 pixels, and the third column would be 30% of the grid itself. So if the second grid were wider than 400 and 40-ish pixels, whatever that uh, adds up to, uh, you would have empty space. If your columns are also narrower in total than the grid element, it doesn't mind. It'll leave empty space if you don't try to use it. So it's very explicit in how you create and set up template columns. Template rows work the same way, and this slide is like 90% the same, only now it's the block axis. What's a block axis? We typically would think immediately horizontal, top to bottom. It's from the start to the end of a block of text. Inline is start to end of a line, a single line of text. Block is start to the end of a block. So if you went to vertical writing mode, your block axis would be this way. Uh, same value, a series of valid lengths, like 1FR and 2FR. And I'll, again, I'll explain what that means, just want to get you used to the syntax. Uh, 50 pixels for the first row, and then we're going to create 10 rows that are each 100 pixels tall. Repeat is a new function added to CSS with the grid layout, and we'll talk about that in a moment as well. So let's say you set up a bunch of template rows and a bunch of template columns. Now you want to put stuff in them. You can name those areas. Uh, you can give them keyword names and then assign things to them relatively quickly. Uh, when you're writing in grid template areas, you can put as many spaces as you want between words. Um, and I'll show you what that looks like in a second. Uh, it gives you a really cool visual effect. Um, and if you use a period, that creates a blank area that you can't assign any keyword named areas to. And if you're wondering, okay, well, how do I put an element in the area? Hang on, uh, we've got a section for properties you can put on children to put them in the right places. So here's what grid template areas looks like in real life. Uh, first of all, we create four columns, one row. It's all one big rectangle. We would put one element in this whole rectangle for the header. I'll skip to the bottom because we've got the same pattern for the footer. And then we've got an empty space we're not going to assign anything to, a column for the body, a column for the sidebar, and an empty space we're not going to put any content in. When I said white space doesn't matter, you can hit the space bar as many times as you want along this line. What it does is it gives us the ability to line things up, and we can actually create a visual version of the grid with these keywords so that as you look at your CSS, you get a rough idea how the grid is going to be shaped. That to me is super powerful. Uh, if you're visually inclined and like that's the way things click for you, this is an awesome method to go with. And in fact, uh, you can add emoji. Uh, double check your browser support, make sure that doesn't act weird. Uh, also check your team style guide to make sure nobody's going to be uh, you know put out by that because they're not you know comfortable typing emoji on the keyboard necessarily. And now here's a bonus. I told you I would slip an extra property or two in. Grid template lets us combine rows, columns, and areas all into one big block of CSS, and now you can see the entire grid all in one shot. This is where I start. This is how I write grids. Always go to grid template first. Rather than putting things on separate lines where everything is laid out horizontally, the row measurements and the column measurements, and then everything else, now I know I've got one row that contains the header spanning both columns, auto height. I've got another row that has a body next to the sidebar, auto height. Final row that has the footer spanning both, auto height, and this first column is 40 ms wide and the second is 20 ms wide, and I can see every detail about my grid just by looking at that block. This is like, the, I don't know, this is my favorite. I get happy when I write grid like this. Uh, if you think about putting like 
four different like width measurements on a whole bunch of children that your inline block are floating and it just all gets scattered. And if your children have to be components of their own and get put in a different SAS or CSS partial and you're all over the map now, this is just so easy to use. Um, I love this. So this is the code pattern I'm gonna use in the code examples we're gonna to get to as we go. The final property for grids for the parent container itself is gap. Creates gaps between columns and between rows. If you saw grid spec like a year ago, you probably saw a lot of code demos using the property called grid gap. That's been changed, no longer using the word grid, now it's just called gap. Uh, anybody know why? Why we dropped the grid quasi prefix on that one, namespacing? Yes, gap is coming to Flexbox, which is amazing because uh, Flexbox is a really cool layout for the things you need it for. And being able to put gaps in between columns and rows is uh, a ridiculously awesome upgrade. Right now that is only supported in Firefox and the whole rest of the can I use graph is thumbs down. Um, so be patient. And if you happen to be, you know, traipsing around in the Edge or Chrome or Safari uh, bug lists, by all means upvote those, uh, those gap bugs for Flexbox. Uh, but once gap is here, it'll be awesome because it creates the gap space before it even starts laying out the columns and the rows. Um, it's a shorthand property. It covers both row and column gap. And it's also an abbreviatable property. First example, you see 20 pixels between rows and 30 pixels between columns. But if you just put gap 20 pixels, you would see 20 pixels between columns and between rows. The browser does a little auto-expanding shortcut, uh, like you find with margin padding and some of the other collapsible syntaxes. Um, that's all for grid container properties. We're going to dig into values, but first pause for questions, review, anything I rushed through or didn't make clear enough. Cool, cool. All righty. So that was properties and everything that goes on the left side uh, of a colon in your CSS. What goes on the right side? What about all our values? Uh, the FR. I said that one a bunch of times and I promised I'd tell you what it means. And so here I am telling you what it means. It's one fraction of the available free space in the grid. Which leads us to another question. What does free space mean? Excellent question, I'm glad you asked. It's the amount of space that's left. It's calculated after all the non-FR measurements and the gap measurements are calculated. And then fraction is a flexible number. It's based on the total number of fractional units in that particular row or column definition, and things get divvied up proportionally. Um, and I've got some examples that are gonna show us exactly what that means in just a moment. Uh, so first of all, since I think examples that we talked through are easier than just rehearsing words from the spec again, uh, this particular grid column measurement would give us one column that's 300 pixels wide. Then we would separate a gap if one was defined. Then all the rest of the space available in that grid parent would be one fraction. We, we would divide it up if we had multiple fractions being used, but since this is just one fraction, it's all the rest of the space in the grid. Um, this is a neat trick, putting one fraction on each end of a couple of fixed width columns, and that centers things automatically when there's enough room for them to be centered. So the browser, as long as we've got our gaps covered, and then we've got 50M for column two and 25M for column three, the browser is going to say, how much space is left? I need half of it here and half of it here, because I've got two equal fractions. One fraction goes in the front, one fraction goes in the back, and now our 75M content and sidebar zone is perfectly centered, no matter how wide the viewport gets. Because all that available space gets divvied up evenly among all the fractions that are demanded by individual columns. We could write four fractions and four fractions, and it would work exactly the same because we're still Doing four out of eight is the same as one out of two. And then you can set up this for your column layout as well. That's kind of a fun trick to do. So how many fractions have we asked the grid to create? Six. First column is going to be one sixth. Second column is going to be two sixths or a third. And the final column is going to be three sixths or a half. No matter how wide the grid gets or how narrow, you're always going to have that one to two to three proportion. So that's fractions. Any questions about fractional units? 
if there's not room to make a fraction, if your fixed measurements, things based on pixels or M's and REMs or percentages or viewport widths, those are all good measurements too. If there's no space left in the grid or if the, the children are overflowing, fractions are gonna be zero because there's nothing to do. A fractional column that ends up being zero width because there's not room for it will still have a column between it and the next column over. Even if a column ends up zero width, you're always going to have gaps. The gap property is always going to be honored. So even if one fraction ends up being zero pixels, you're still going to have whatever your gap measurement is next to it. So if you had, if a fraction was zero width, can you have no gap? If your gap was zero, then yeah, it would look all collapsed. The next column that actually had width would be up against the previous thing that was a boundary marker, whether the edge of the grid or a previous column. So the first one did Not quite. Um, auto does not necessarily get wider than the element you put in that grid column needs to be. So if you did 300 picks and then you put a block of text that was only 200 pixels wide, then auto would, would only be 200 pixels wide and it wouldn't keep growing. If you're using background colors, that would make a huge difference. If you don't care about that and empty space is empty space, it would So just to kind of visualize things, there are four really tiny uh, stripes over on this side that are gonna represent our columns. There's a dark green one, a whitish green, yellow, and then another dark green. I think green, I'm colorblind. Um, so let's start with a blank grid, and the first thing we're gonna do to think through how the grid calculates these things and gets us to fractions is our gap space. Let's add gaps. We use one rem, which is 100% of the root font size and that gives us 16 pixels in this context between each of our columns. So we've got our columns set up, awesome. Let's go ahead and give the columns uh, that need fixed width, or percentage-based width, non-fractional, 50% uh, and 25%. We still got a super skinny column you can barely see because of the way it blurs in the background here, and another super skinny column that's only wide enough to show background color here. Uh, but now we've got zero for the first width and zero for the final width. Let's change those zeros to one fraction each and see what we get. They become the same width. And now our large column and our narrow column are centered. And let's go ahead and add some row measurements. You might be able to see the tiny purplish on the top and yellow on the bottom, the brighter yellow. Orange, it looks like a projector, I guess. Um, yeah, and now we've got row measurements as well. So that is like piece by piece how we can visualize the grid I keep using in the example code coming together. Uh, fraction is like actual fraction, right? Like math fraction. Like yeah. we'll do the math if it doesn't really add up. So as, know, many, nice as many FRs as you define, mm -hmm. each column that has an FR measurement is it's a value over the total, just like a fraction. Right, we did like in the previous example, if you did not 50, 25, it was like you know, 63 and you know, 31, yeah. or something like that. It would math it out. Yes, if we did two fractions and then one on the beginning, um, and then one fraction on the end, this space would be twice as wide as this space. They would stay proportional to one another, using up whatever free space is available. That might be one of like, the most complicated like measurement things to get used to in grid, but it's awesome. And we're gonna look at some real life demos later on that show us how awesome it is in real practical cases. Repeat is the next thing we're going to look at. It's a function. We've already seen it. The first value you put in it is the number of times to repeat, and the second value is the uh, length to repeat. And here we have bootstrap and foundation, right? Throw a gap 20 pixels underneath there, and uh, you've got 12 even columns, and there's a 20 pixel gap between each pair of columns. Pretty nifty. Is um, the count always going to be in pixels? Uh, no, the count is an integer. So this is going to create 12 columns. Each one is a fraction wide. This one doesn't sit perfectly right with me. I, I feel like it should be repeat one fraction 12 times, but this is the way it works. Uh, count first, then length. Or count, then measurement might be a less ambiguous way to say it. But that's just from MDM, sorry. Min-max is a cool function that I'm only going to just touch on briefly. Uh, it works best when you have like a fixed measurement and a flexible measurement. And essentially it says, 
This column or row, if you're using row measurement, can never be less than the min measurement and never more than the maximum measurement. So it finds the value between the two lengths. Its name is literally the order of arguments, min, max, minimum, maximum. So it's pretty manageable for remembering. This, for example, will give us a column that is never narrower than 10 pixels, even if there's no free space available. But as soon as it's got free space available, ah, gotta stop doing that. As soon as there's free space available, take all of it, or, or take one fraction of it, compared to whatever else is in that row. Uh, this has got a really cool application that I'm not gonna show tonight because it's over in the implicit grid side of the way things get set up. Uh, but you can create a CSS grid that is intrinsically flexible the children or the columns have a min max, it's like 200 pixels comma one fraction. And the repeat value has a keyword instead of a number that's auto fit. And as your browser gets wider, it goes from like one column to two columns, to three columns, to four columns. And if you just leave it 100% wide, as wide as a user can get their screen. So you got, you know, a super dev with a 40 inch curved monitor. You get like an eight column layout on your grid and you didn't get a single media query to do. So MinMax has some really cool, almost magical applications for internally contained responsiveness, uh, which is kind of moving the, the goalpost a little closer to a CSS wish list that hasn't happened yet, which is element queries or container queries are called more often. Like I wish my component, my element was responsive to its own size, not to the viewport. I literally couldn't care less about the viewport. I want the element to do one thing when it's wider than 400 pixels and another thing when it's 399 or narrower. Uh, some of those cool in implicit grid things can get you there, and minmax is a nifty function that helps. And yeah, that's it on the parent values. Before we get into child properties, of which I'm going to show you one, any questions on the parent grid stuff? Um, I might be showing my child here back right here, but with minmax, is it actually just using media queries in the back end, or is it? Not like nope, it's just flexible, yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it doesn't secretly tap into any kind of browser awareness. Mm -hmm. It's content awareness. So everything we've looked at so far is CSS that gets attached to the container. This is what I said about the paradigm shift. We're used to putting all these measurements and floats and everything in all the children, but now we've just realized, oh, no, 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 I should put all of the measurements, all of the columns and all the rows and all the everything on the parent. And then I can just take children and slap them where they need to go with one property. And that's the one property we're gonna look at now. Grid area. The simplest value for it is a name from our grid template areas, all those little coded strings where we visualized and wrote in visually uh, recognizable code what our grid should look like and be shaped like. Any of those keywords, that's all you need. Uh, there's a second uh, value you could put in here, which I mentioned just to be thorough. Um, it's also can take a value that's a shorthand for row start slash column start slash row end slash column end for integers. It also does some auto expanding where if you just put a one, it goes one slash one, span one, span one, and some defaults. Um, but I'm not telling you how to do that today. We're just going to worry about the named areas. This is the only part of the slide to really worry about. This is just to be thorough and so you don't get surprised. If you try to name a grid area two, uh, you're in for trouble because the browser, when you try to assign an element, a child to grid area two, it could be like, oh yeah, row start two, I got you, I'll put it there. And that's not exactly what you were looking for, I would bet. So all of your named grid area zones, and I'll mention this in another slide, but for the sake of saying now, all of your named grid areas, those names have to include letters and can't be integers. Oh, one more mind-blowing thing I forgot to say on fraction, you don't have to stick with whole numbers. You can use percentages, you can use uh, decimals and floats there. So if you're a real big like golden ratio geek, you can do one fraction, 1.618 fraction. And the browser will go, cool, I need a total of 2.618 fractions, and one out of 2.618 goes here, and 1.618 out of 2.618 goes over here. And it'll automatically do the ratio for you. Boom. So that's a fun cool thing. The number of times I've written a float-based uh, value has been zero in terms of fractional units, but should you need to, you can. Or you can stick with whole numbers and just use Fibonacci. That works too, if you really need that golden ratio. So, there we go, congrats, you know enough grid to go. And make grids, the properties we've covered will get you through, I'm gonna guess like 80, 90% of the grid layouts. 
and pretty much every explicit grid layout you would need to do. If you wanted to find every single row and column, you know enough now uh, to go out and do that. So anyone anyway, want to see some real-life use cases? Yes. Cool. Do you have questions before we do? I'll just say that okay. I'm a, like, I use Flex, I love Flex, and I was like, well, I'll come, you know, <laughs> we'll talk about grid, but I, I really see the benefit to it uh, comparatively, so I appreciate you changed your mind. Cool. <laughs> I wanna, I'm excited to try it out. Cool. Yeah. Can you use Flex to sign up with the grid area? So the answer is yes. Uh, a child of a grid can be a flex container. A child of a grid can be its own grid container. Is that how you usually would, would you turn it into its own grid if you wanted to, or you can decide to maybe turn it into its own grid? Is that yeah. yeah. You can turn a child into its own grid if it needs that same layout kind of pattern, so that same syntax for layout. So maybe, for example, your whole page is a grid, and then you've got a giant header element up in the header zone. And your header might be laid out with a grid that has a grid column, you know, like 20 pic or 40 pixels for the logo and then one fraction for the navigation. Is that where your subgrid is going to like play a part? Yeah, I was about to say that. Awesome okay. question. Subgrid is coming. It's in Firefox and it might be in like Chrome with a flag or it's in Chrome and Firefox behind the flag, one of those two combinations. And what subgrid lets you do is all the grid template stuff we looked at on the grid parent, set that up. Then you have a child element, you make it display grid, and then do grid template columns subgrid, and it will inherit the parent's values, and it will all snap to one big fixed column kind of thing. And it will work like table layout, always all, we always kind of wanted it to. Right now, if you have a whole bunch of grid containers all in a row that all use the same grid, oh, I'm actually gonna show you a minute, let's just do it. This thing, uh, anybody who's been in like a WordPress or Drupal like has a, a table full of posts they need to edit is used to this kind of layout. There it goes. We got a title, we got a series of actions we can take, we got the last date it was uh, published or edited or whatever, and you got a little uh, pill tag token, whatever you want to call that, for its current status. Well, let's look at how to do this in grid. Your knee jerk reaction might be like, okay, the whole list, display grid, then start setting up columns. That's not going to get you anything on the children right now. Unfortunately, children can't use their parents' properties and force the grandchildren to obey those rules. Subgrid will allow that. Subgrid will let us set up like, boom, so we get like one giant column gap here, and every single second column, each row, obeys that. Uh, right now, grid is a one level deep layout map. If you want nested grids, you gotta keep doing display grid and more template rows and template columns on each child. So for example, in this, every row is just a row. The parent container has no styles attached to it. Each row is display grid. We got a box for the title and a box for the date, a box for the actions and a box for the current status. Each row is auto height. We've got a half a rem gap between them all. The first row, which, or sorry, first column, which contains titles and actions, is as much space as it can get, like greedy one fraction measurement. And the date and status column is a keyword, which I'll explain now, called max content. That's our second bonus, but once it's on that intro slide. Max content says, I don't want any line breaks if we can avoid it. But I also don't want this to be any wider than it has to be. It's got a partner called min content, which would put a line break in at every space character it possibly could. And min content's like, as long as you don't have to break a word or hyphenate something, smash it. Max content says, no, 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 let's let all the spaces stand. Don't force any breaks where they don't have to be. But also, you know, don't get wider. So, okay. So here, our column gap is gonna be right next to the A. And here, it's like one character farther over, but also next to the A. These two M's are gonna line up coincidentally. This M is gonna be a little farther back, so the columns. In each row, the column gap is gonna be in a slightly different place. It's way over here for February, because it's a much longer string. Subgrid is gonna let us clean that all up. Subgrid is gonna set things up so that February constrains the width of this entire column and there's only one gap measurement that's consistent through all the rows. And when subgrid lands, we'll put all the grid measurements on the parent and then the children will say grid template columns, subgrid, which is like inherit keyword from CSS but on steroids for grid. So all that says, what we're actually doing this is each row is its own grid, 
And by doing um, max content here, what we're saying is we're never gonna truncate or collapse or line break the date. But if we had a narrow viewport or a super long title, and it wanted to get here and bump into the gap, the title would break lines. But we would never line break on the date. Or if we had a really, really narrow date, like there was a month that was considerably shorter than the word April, there's just June and it's oh, May, so May would work. If we had May, it would be just a pixel shorter than the, the published title. Uh, so in that case, published would never be forced to line break either, or to hyphen it itself or anything weird. That's how you might do like a post edit table if you are rewriting a, a WordPress style uh, editing experience. Here's a component we might have, and we're gonna be responsive of this one, on our employees page, or maybe you're doing like the IMDB, and you have your object actor, actress, data, and you're doing people profiles, whatever. Uh, we've got an imaginary person uh, based on a real photograph named Rita. Uh, and so what we've got here is a few different blocks. Okay. We've got the photo is one element, the header, which contains her name, title, and contact is another element. Her bio is a third child, and then the final child element is the list with a headline called awards. So that's a relatively simple markup, just four children. Uh, but how do we make this a grid? You might be thinking, well, I don't, I don't see any kind of uh, row gap, right? There's nothing, there's not a row. There's like, this should be a row, but it crashes into the photo, and this should be a row, but it crashes into the list. How, how can we do that with CSS grid? We can combine some grids with this. We can create an overlap between the photos and the awards list that I've just shown with the highlighting here. So the first row contains photo on the first half, which is 30% wide, and header taking up the rest of the space, auto height. The second has whatever remains of the photo, if it's taller than the header, and then we start the award list, auto height as well. And now we move to the bio and whatever remains from the awards list. And we have one fraction for the height, as tall as it needs to be. We've got a rim between rows and three rims between columns. So moving back, if we were to visualize this, we actually do have a row gap that goes all the way across here, but the photo spans it and takes up two rows worth. And we've got another row gap that goes all the way across here, but because we have two rows worth of space for awards, it also spans that gap. And sorry, that's kind of deep end. I jumped into the complicated part of this component to begin with. Um, so because of that, we've got, we actually do have three rows. One is a rectangle here, two is a rectangle through there, and then three is this rectangle for the bottom. But because photo and awards are both allowed to span and both take part in that second row, we get the overlap we're looking for here and not having a giant big empty gap underneath the front. On a smaller screen though, we'd want to do something like this. Um, now we've got some visible rows up here for the photo and for the contact and the header, but now we've got full width bio and full width list of awards, and so our template changes. And this is all we have to change in our media query. Uh, we've now got photo and header sharing a row, 50, 150 pixels max width for the photo, or 150 pixels width, not max. A fraction, all the remaining space for the header, Bio takes up a full row, and awards takes up a full row. Here, I could use auto for the final one, and that would be perfect too, because height is super awesome, and it's really flexible. It's hard to make height be different from auto. And then on mobile, we want to get a little more streamlined, and so now our, our grid template gets really, really simple. Photo is just however tall it needs to be. Header is as tall as it needs to be. Everything's 100% wide. It's just a two row, no column, one column. And fun, fun gotcha here, the awards in the bio, which have been hidden, need to be hidden with CSS. You can't just not assign elements to a grid zone and hope they disappear. Grid is kind of fun like that. It's really uh, content tolerant, and grid is really averse to losing things. Grid will just go ahead and create extra rows and stick those elements in it. So if we didn't have display none, it would be as though we had photo, header, bio, and awards still in our grid template. Uh, grid just create two more rows and stick things in them. Um, and again, a word of accessibility uh, advice, don't use display none, because I'm assuming even on a mobile device, you want the screen reader to have access to that text. So you'd probably do something like a screen reader only block of CSS with absolute positioning and a clip path and the kind of thing you can get on all the accessibility blocks. Uh, that'd be a great different talk too. Uh, but you'd want to hide that in an accessible way, not just display none. 
So we went from this to this to this, and all we did was change grid template and add a couple of display properties. Pretty fun. We can do cool image layouts with grid. Uh, here we've got a big square and a little square and a bunch of tall uh, rectangles and a wide rectangle and a handful more little squares. And that looks like this. Remember I warned you you can't use a plain integer for a named grid area? That's why I stuck a letter I on every named area. And what I'm not showing you is all nine of these photos would be grid area I1, I2, I3, and you would individually set that. But I like it because it's the only property you have to put on the children is a grid area, uh, which still beats a lot of the other layout methods. So we make a big square for one, a little square for two, tall three, tall four, little five, tall six, little seven, wide eight, little nine. And that gave us this. I had a client project that wanted this layout, and everything is a giant clockwise uh, circle from the inside out. So right, we start with one, we scoot around to two, to five, to nine, and leaving the corners to 13, to seven, 18, 23, 29, 35, 40. 41 images, and then they wanted to crop it and rotate it like 12 degrees, and it was going to be a background image. A lot of work for a background image. Uh, at the end of the day, I think the image API they ran ended up generating images for us, which is a much better solution. But if we wanted to do it in grid, there we go, and there's our grid template. It's big, but on the bright side, by looking at it, you know exactly what shape it's going to be. Uh, your code editor will not put a purple rectangle around things, probably that's just your slides. Uh, it would be cool if it did though. A little bit of highlighting for shared grid areas. And then 10 pixel gap. Uh, the reason everything is square, by the way, in this is not just because we have one fraction here and one fraction here, because this is a fraction of the width and this is a fraction of the height. The way they all come up perfectly square is because also for this image grid, uh, we would have height and width fixed to the same value something like 90 viewport minimums, so it always stays inside of any viewport any size. I think that's what I did with the slide. Any questions about any of those examples? Before I just a real quick wrap up with some things maybe you wouldn't expect, just to keep in mind, kind of got you some. Yeah? Uh, what was the name of the, that syntax that you must have for the two underscores? Oh, double underscore? Yeah. Yeah, so BEM, or B-E-M, is a CSS naming methodology. Okay. And what it says is the root of a component is the block. Any child or grandchild you need to name is an element. So if you have a card component, it would be card, class. Card header would be card, double under, header. Card, you know, action buttons would be card, double under, action, dash buttons. And if you had a variable, like a modifier, like you had card, dark, or card, sale, if it was like a product page. You would do card dash dash or double hyphen sale. And so double underscore communicates child, and double hyphen communicates a different uh, state and modifier. Uh, the work I do, we use them for everything, so it just shows up in all of our code examples. So, a couple things to watch out for with named grid areas. Obviously, strings, not integers. I already said the last thing on the slide like three times. But it has to be one rectangle made out of adjacent cells. You can't wrap a corner with a named grid area. You can't do part of the top row and part of the bottom row. They have to be adjacent, and they have to make one rectangle. Yes, squares are including other rectangles. Um, yeah, otherwise your grid template area's property will be invalid, and your browser will discard it, and you'll get whatever junk happens from the whole back. It would be nice if we could kind of do that, like some of it goes here, and the rest of it flows to down here. That's a whole different CSS module that's been under consideration for like five years. Uh, it's called Regions, and it's, at this point, I'm not expecting it to show up during my career. That was overly pessimistic. I'm not expecting it in the next five years. Uh, images can be weird in a grid. If you put an IMG, an actual image, in a grid zone, named grid area, the grid's aspect ratio for that particular named area is going to struggle against the images, and it's going to override the image's native aspect ratio, and so you can get some squishing and squashing and skewing, that's not great. Uh, and also, it takes away the image's ability to let its intrinsic aspect ratio control its grid size. If you had the image taking up space in a grid column that was auto width, uh, the image would lose its ability to do something like that. Uh, particularly if you had the image doing auto width and auto height for a column and a row, and you expected its aspect ratio to take over, 
the grid's going to win. So put your image in a div, and your problem is basically solved. Or if it's better for your semantic markup, the figure with a caption, however you're doing things. Uh, but yeah, put the image in a wrapper element, and you're going to be okay. Fixed heights are things you should avoid. Um, if you start fixing the heights on your grid rows, you run into content flowing out of a grid row, and that's awful because now it looks like the grid is built by somebody who doesn't know how to build grids. And that's a, that's a bad thing for users trying to enjoy your site and get things done, and it's a bad look for you and your you know, manager or rest of your team, whoever won't enjoy it. So stick with flexible values in the row height. Auto, min content, max content are all super things. I used fractions a few times. Those tend to work pretty well. Um, but they do a cool thing if you start doing like one fraction, two fraction for grid row heights. Yeah, the engine calculates the minimum amount of space it needs to fit whatever is in the one fraction row, and then it just doubles up to the two fraction row. It gets a little, a little cool and goofy there. Animation is something people love to ask about grids. Can I animate stuff in a grid? Kind of. Um, in some browsers, which I think is limited to Chrome and Firefox, which means that people have updated Edge from Firefox and Edge. Um, Grid template columns and grid template rows can kind of be animated if, what are the conditions? You have the same number in each one. You can't animate from three columns to seven. Uh, and if you have the same kind of units, it can't animate from 20% to three fractions. It can't animate from 12 pixels to a fraction. It's, it's got to be, you know, the same kind of units uh, for each column you're trying to animate. Gap is a little easier because you can go from 20 pixels to 40 pixels real quick and probably spin a gap halfway decent. Um, as always, it's not transform, it's not opacity, so performance is really hairy if you're trying to do grid template animations. So the short answer is don't bother because it's not cross-browser reliable. It's got some really strenuous constraints on it and it's probably gonna be a little stuck. And then, like this is the dream, but I don't think we're ever gonna get there. Can I animate an element between two different grid areas? If yeah, that would be fun, wouldn't it? Uh, but the problem is, most of the time, two different grid areas are going to have the possibility, at least if not the actuality, of being two different dimensions. And for the browser to try and adjust the element's height and width, as it moves from like this corner to that corner, it's way too much going on, there's just not a performance anymore. So no, you can't animate from grid start one to grid you know, row start three. Sorry. Grid versus flex box, full slide. Uh, grid has two dimensions, flex has one. Uh, with fractions and the other things, grid has more precise sizing. Uh, flex forces a little more flexibility. It can be hard if you have to fight against it. Uh, whereas grid lets you be super precise from the get-go if that's all you want to do. And currently, grid has gap, and Firefox is the only browser that has a flex gap. So, not useful in production. And the last sad thing is IE11, as we covered. Uh, first browser to implement grid, yay! Didn't have a completed spec when they implemented it, not yay. Um, so my recommendation is this. Use fallback layout in CSS that is not grid to handle IE11. Find some cool flex box that approximates what you need and gets really close to it, but don't worry about being like pixel precise with grid. Uh, two reasons. A, remind the stakeholders in the business that their IE11 stats are dropping by the day. Remind them how much it costs for you to do work uh, and ask them to put the two together. Also remind them that people who are on IE 11 are missing out on a lot of stuff on a lot of the web and, and assure them that you're going to give a usable experience. Okay, don't, don't just like destroy the page on IE 11 because, you know, screw that. And instead, create a decent fallback. Maybe it's one column, maybe it's a split column and there aren't varied widths on things. Cool, just get it done in a way that still presents all the content usably and legibly to the users and say this is the best thing we can do for IE 11 because they don't support grid but every other property gets, every other browser gets advanced stuff in the print. Um, very few people are going to really strenuously argue about and given them a completely usable experience that still looks good, everybody else gets the perfect experience. Um, I work for a client, however, that did have us doing literal pixel precision in IE 11 up until like eight months ago. That was exciting. Uh, if you're using the auto prefixer tool on your CSS, that can't help. It has an option for its config called grid, and if you make it true, it writes IE11 fallback. It's not great because IE11 never supports grid and named areas. So all the named area stuff I showed you, IE11 is like, oh, what? I don't know. Um, and Auto Prefixer does a, an amazingly good job approximating that. It finds every element you've assigned to a named grid area in the same CSS file, 
and then figures out based on the grid template areas you did what all the right row start column start row and column end measurements are, and it then puts those into the old fallback for ID CSS value. And it's surprising how close it gets. It's really good. Um, but then ID has zero gap support whatsoever. So if you're using gaps in your grid, you're gonna have to work really hard to get them to work in ID mode. Because uh, you have to start introducing margins and padding or some other value to get where you have to go. Here's a great list of resources, and if you're into the URL on the bottom, jds.li slash grid intro, uh, all this is all web stuff, so you can get all these links on the web. Uh, Rachel Andrew knows more about grid, I'm convinced, than any human on the planet. Uh, any other human on the planet is brilliant. She and Jen Simmons have done so much work uh, with browser vendors and the spec team. And if you have any opportunity to hear Rachel or Jen or a host of other awesome developers speak about grid, but those two in particular, like they are the experts. Uh, we have them to thank for that six, seven month block for browser release uh, window and all the consistency and they're continuing to push a subgrid and help browser vendors implement it correctly and they're brilliant, awesome people in the community, so check them out. If, grid, uh, if games help you learn stuff, there's a little game where you have to write the right grid property to put the right pictures in the right squares. Uh, it's kind of fun. I did a code pen collection with a bunch of different other examples of grids, some of the ones we saw tonight, and the wall layouts that are relatively common. And returning to my ID11 advice, Yuna Kravitz is an awesome developer too. She's on Google's like material design, DevRel kind of team. And she's put together a great website that says, here's a common thing you'd want to do in grid. Here's how to get the next best thing in Flexbox. Not exactly like the grid, but it's pretty close. And here's a great fallback for ID11 is what it wants to so cool, thanks y'all for being here tonight. You've been a cool audience, and uh, glad you made it. I'm James again, uh, you can contact me at, what am I doing, there you go. All these places, Twitter, GitHub, blog, those are links. But JD Steinbach is my handle on all the places. So yeah, uh, love to answer more questions. If you have them, stick around, hit me up on the internet. And again, thanks for being here.